everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I am going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be a scaly friend of ours, because we are covering the oh-so-wonderful anglerfish. This is a very special listener episode dedicated to Logan, MJ, Brady, and his dad Kyle. Now, MJ, Brady, and his dad Kyle actually requested the football fish, which is a kind of anglerfish. So that is why you are being shouted out and why this episode is dedicated to you. The football fish is also, of course, a pertinent suggestion given the fact that right now the World Cup is raging, everybody's cheering for their teams, and so here we are today covering an animal that has a subspecies known as the football fish. But thank you for your request, Logan, MJ, Brady, and Kyle. This episode would not have been possible without your wonderful suggestion. For how to request your very own episode and for the resources that were used in this episode, all of that information will be at the end of the episode, but it is also immediately accessible in the show notes or the description. And now we are going to begin to slow down as we begin and prepare ourselves to not journey into the forests or to trek on high mountains, but rather to go into the deep sea. And so, of course, any sort of journey like this requires some preparation, and I have two exhortations for each and every one of you. The first is that you bring a sweater, because we are going to be going into a high-tech research vessel that will allow us to plumb the depths of the sea. And the second is that you try your best to imitate jello. All of us carry tension in one way or another. For some of us, it's in the head, for some in the shoulders, in the legs. But regardless of where it is, and everybody's truly different here, my request of you is the same. Do your best to imbibe jello and allow your body to totally relax because we will not need all of that tension where we are going. And so allow your mind to wander and journey with me as we are stepping foot onto this research vessel and as we break the ocean's surface and begin our descent into the deep blue sea where the anglerfish resides. Now, the reason we did not put on our scuba gear like we do many a time as we go into the ocean is because how deep we are going, which we will find out in just a moment, comes with beauty, of course, but also comes with remarkable pressure. As we descend deeper and deeper into the water, the pressure increases and at these depths where the anglerfish swims and enjoys itself is not a habitable condition for us as human beings. And so we are aboard this very high-tech research vessel that allows us to maneuver these areas with comfort and ease and we can simply enjoy the view that is provided to us. Now many of us are familiar with the anglerfish. Admittedly, the only contact I have had with this creature has been in cartoons. Once these creatures were first discovered, our curiosity peaked to such a degree that it was thrown into some of the biggest movies that many of us know by heart. Our curiosity was so piqued because of how special and how unique this creature is, as we will learn. The anglerfish is, of course, a fish. They are a sort of fish that is very deep 
under the water of our seas. They live in what is called the bathypelagic zone of the open ocean, at least many of the subspecies do. That fancy word, bathypelagic, indicates depth specifically. So it is a layer of the ocean. This zone describes between 1,000 to 4,000 meters under the water, or about 3,280 to 13,120 feet. But for our case today, we are swimming at a depth of 6,600 feet, or 2,000 meters under the water. So when we say that this is a deep sea fish, it really is a deep sea fish. They lure prey towards them with their fishing rod-like appendages, and once an unsuspecting fish swims just too close, the anglerfish will snap them up. As we will learn later in the episode, this is exactly how they got their name. These deep-sea fish catch fish themselves. There are over 200 species of deep-sea anglerfish, one of the species that was requested was the football fish, which is one of those over 200 species. Today we are covering the sort of broad term of anglerfish. All of those subspecies are worth our attention, but for today we are looking at many of them at the same time. These fish are immediately recognizable by their jaws that are aligned with their teeth, razor sharp and varying in length. But as is the case with many other animals we have covered, these over 200 species can differ very widely. The black sea devil, which has those very characteristic and recognizable toothy jaws gesticulating out every which way, varying in length. But then on the other side, you have the bottom-dwelling sea toad that is also a deep-sea anglerfish, and so they do come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Many common anglerfish will be around the size of a coffee cup, but then there are some species in which the females can reach over 100 pounds. Some of them can even grow to over 3 feet in length. Now the reason why I singled out the females in specific in regards to how large they are is because depending on the species, males can be just one-tenth of the size of females. The largest of the anglerfish that have been discovered so far are known as warty sea devils. And to give just an illustration as to how seriously different the males and the females can be, the females of this particular species can reach up to three feet long, while males can measure in at under an inch. That is like putting a baseball bat beside a paper clip. The average baseball bat is about three feet, while paper clips are often just an inch long. And so that gives us just some relative illustration as to how different they can be. And now focusing on their claim to fame, which is their hunting strategy, here at depths of 6,600 feet, meals can sometimes be few and far between, but the anglerfish has adopted a very unique strategy that can help them find their next meal. Instead of, like many of the creatures we have covered in the past, instead of expending energy to hunt prey, the anglerfish sports a fishing pole-like rod that projects from its head. At the end of this rod is a sack full of bioluminescent bacteria. That word bioluminescent simply means light that is given off from a biological source or light given off from something living. And so this bacteria that is within this sack at the end of the rod on their head exudes a light that can be very alluring in the deep dark depths where we are. 
It will glow brightly, and this light will attract curious prey towards their open waiting mouth, functioning logically much like we as humans fish and lure and bait. Today, while we are navigating in the Atlantic Ocean, most of the species of anglerfish are going to live in the murky depths of the Antarctic Oceans as well as the Atlantic. But there are some species of this over 200 that will live in shallow tropical environments instead, submitting again a very stark contrast between these subspecies. Now that lure that we have just learned about, one important aspect of the lure is that it is only on the females of the anglerfish. So whenever we see this very distinctive feature in a cartoon or in a documentary, we have to understand that this is a female 100% of the time. The males of all of the anglerfish species are without this characteristic or this thing that we associate most with the anglerfish. So this rod that we learned about is actually a piece of their dorsal spine that will protrude above their mouth. And the females, in addition to being much larger than the males on average, will be the only ones to sport these fishing lures. Now, with this fishing lure, they can draw squid, small fish, and even other cephalopods. If we remember from previous episodes, what a cephalopod is, is a predatory mollusk that encompasses that large class that we have covered some animals in already, that class cephalopoda, which will include animals like octopus and squid. Now, among the differences between the males and females, I don't believe that we have covered anything like this in the previous 120-something-odd episodes. The male anglerfish are considered to be what is termed parasitic mates. Now, we have learned about parasitic relationships, symbiotic relationships, commensal relationships. These are the relationships that describe behavior between different creatures. And this is why they are called parasitic mates. When a young, free-swimming male anglerfish encounters a female in the deep sea, what he will do is latch onto her with his sharp teeth, and over time the male will physically fuse with the female, fusing or connecting to her skin and even to her bloodstream, but in the process losing his eyes, all of his internal organs except the reproductive ones. And a female anglerfish can carry six or more males on her body at any one time. It is facts like this that represent the strangeness, the mysteriousness, the wonder of the natural world. And what else I think is important is that much of the deep sea remains entirely undiscovered or unknown. This is simply one of the creatures in that vast ecosystem, and it exhibits a mating behavior that is one of the most strange that we have covered on the show so far. For those that are working in the field of marine biology or in any way work with the deep, dark oceans, what an exciting business. Who knows what other kind of wonderfully strange creatures are there. Now, let us go back to their hunting or to their anatomy for just a moment. The anglerfish, once it has lured in its prey, can swallow creatures that are pretty big, and the reason they can do this is because they have a large mouth, so large, in fact, that it can extend all over the entire circumference of their head. Their wide mouths will have jaws that are lined with those inwardly inclined small teeth, 
and these teeth have a specialized shape. In addition to them being inwardly inclined as opposed to going every which way outside of the fish, or even just shooting straight up, these teeth can also be flattened. This serves two specific purposes. The first is that when food is coming in, it doesn't create any resistance to the fish actually going into the mouth, as if the teeth would block or create some restriction. The second benefit of having their teeth like this is that it offers a prevention for the food actually escaping out of the mouth. They act something like a trap that once they are in the anglerfish's mouth, getting out is a monumental task. The bones of the anglerfish are thin and incredibly flexible, which is what allows it to extend its jaw so far as well as its stomach. This allows it to swallow prey that is twice as large as the body of the anglerfish itself. The way this fish actually eats is also interesting. The closest thing we could point to to give an illustration is a vacuum. Their mouth works something like that. After they have drawn in their prey with their bioluminescent lures, they will rapidly throw open their large mouths and what results is a powerful suction movement that will draw in everything surrounding their mouth, which includes the fish in this case, of course, drawing that fish in rapidly into their mouth, after which, of course, their teeth fiercely guard any kind of exit. We just talked about parasitic relationships just a moment ago, but I want to talk about a symbiotic relationship for a moment. A symbiotic relationship is one in which both creatures or species or life forms, a symbiotic relationship, by contrast to what we have already learned, is one in which two creatures, animals, mutually benefit from each other. This relationship is seen in the anglerfish in relation to their bioluminescent bacteria. So the female anglerfish is not the only one benefiting from having this light upon their head. While that is the benefit the female draws, the bioluminescent bacteria is only able to survive in seawater and the deep sea habitat in which the anglerfish swims around in is perfect for their survival. And so the bacteria have a home and in exchange make those chemicals necessary for that light to be shining. While sometimes creatures in the natural world don't get along too well, sometimes they do. One thing that I forgot to mention is actually their scientific name. Their common name, of course, is the anglerfish, but their scientific name is Lophiformes. As always, we can mine this etymology to figure out why the scientific name was used for the animal. The prefix lopho comes from a Greek word that can mean a plethora of different things, among which are the crest of a helmet, the crest of a hill. All of them have this sort of ridge or crest kind of connotation. Now, this distinction sort of confused me at first because I did not see some sort of large crested fin going somewhere. If we remember what we learned earlier, that rod that carries that bioluminescent bulb is actually a piece of dorsal spine that protrudes out from their body. And so perhaps this crest, this ridge, is referring to that rod specifically. That is only a guess of mine. I have not found the answer to that question, but maybe that is it. And now let us move to the name of the creature itself the anglerfish. What does it mean? Where does it come from? Let's first break down angler. Where exactly does this come from? It was used to describe a fisher with a hook and line. It was used as early as the mid-15th century, and this is a noun that was taken from the verb angle, and what it means is to fish with a hook. 
So of course we see how this could apply to the anglerfish given the fact that they participate in their own deep sea fishing with lures and hooked teeth. And now let us move to a review submitted by a special listener out there. Today it is written by Bells with a lot of L's and S's. And Bells writes all the way from the United States of America. My favorite podcast ever. I struggle so much with falling asleep and this podcast has helped me so, so much with getting asleep. I love learning all these facts, which helps my brain relax and focus on some animals rather than the stressful bits of my day. Thank you. I'm currently listening to my listener episode and couldn't be more happy. Smiley face. Well, Bells, I'm very happy that you got your very own listener episode and that you are currently listening to it as you were writing this review. I can't tell you and all of you listening how grateful I am to be among somebody's favorite podcasts. I'm also grateful that I can help you, Bells, specifically with falling asleep and helping you relax. I'm glad you enjoy the show, and I'm very happy that you are a special part of it. And that, of course, goes for each and every one of you listening. If this podcast helps you in any way, and you would like to give back to the show, leaving a review, whether it is good or bad, is one of the biggest ways to give back. It helps me to make the show better. It allows it to grow and gives more people the ability to find the show and to relax right alongside us. As far as I'm concerned, the more people that join us, in this case, would have joined us on the research vessel. If you would like more of the podcast, including exclusive episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash relaxwithanimalfacts or just go into the link in the description or show notes of this episode. All of the tiers are exactly the same and give you full access to all the content. I wanted to make sure as many people could come as possible and make those episodes as accessible as I could. All of the facts used in this episode came from nationalgeographic.com, monterebayaquarium.org, worldatlas.com, a to z animals.com, etimonline.com, and oceana.org. All of those resources are in the description. This episode would not have been possible without their important contributions. And so if you feel so inclined and encouraged to explore their resources, I encourage you to do so. What a creature we have learned about today. I think this is the first time in the podcast in which we had the opportunity to traverse the depths in a submarine or research vessel. How cool is that? It's certainly no cooler than the animal we learned about today. It just shows me how much more wonder there is in the world that I have not yet discovered and that I hope to share with all of you. Thank you all for joining me on this episode of the Relax with Animal Facts podcast. If you like it, you can follow, you can share, but the greatest thing that you can do is to join me on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.